You like rap music? Well, turn around real slow then. I'm from the Rap Coalition of America. Take that gun off and throw it over there. Throw the gun over there. If you like rap music so much, how come you ain't smiling? I'm smiling. Smile, smile real big. I'm smiling. And let's do a rap together. Yo, baby, yo, baby, yo. Yo, baby, yo, baby. Yo. Eddie Murphy is back as a Detroit cop fighting Southern California crime in Beverly Hills Cop 2, and we're going to be reviewing it this week. I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Sisko of the Chicago Tribune, and I wasn't the biggest fan of Beverly Hills Cop, the first one, too much action crowding out Eddie Murphy's one-liners in that film for me. And the same is even more true with this even less successful sequel. Once again, Murphy is back in Los Angeles, this time tracking a beautiful woman who is part of a gang of gun runners. Sylvester Stallone's wife, Bridget Nielsen, is the woman, and Murphy links up with her at a gun club, operated by Dean Stockwell. Chip, perfect timing for one. Chip Kane, I'm the manager here. How are you, Chip? It's a beautiful place, you guys. Very comfortable. We do our best. Uh, maybe you'd like to have a guest membership. Yeah, that'd be nice. We kind of like shooting guns in the house. Where could I send you an application? 1603 Hillcrest. It's a big white house. Beautiful place. We'll send it along with the 44 shells. Well, I'll be sure to duck. While tracking the gun runners, Murphy lives the good life in Beverly Hills, occupying a vacant house, entertaining his cop friends from the original movie. Coming up, a predictable sight gag. Still in this house. My uncle's house. I want you out of this pool and out of this house in seven minutes. You're still a police officer, for Christ's sake. You're going to get us all in deep. Well, I love when you talk dirty. Get your mad ass in this pool with me. Axel, get out of the damn pool! Predictable. Another problem with the film? Non-stop action, when all we really want to hear is Eddie Murphy talk funny, which he finally does at a party at Hugh Hefner's mansion, where he meets the leader of the gun-running gang, who has just wounded one of Murphy's police friends. Are we having a problem here? Hef! You Hefner! That's a foley! I'm sorry, I feel like I know you already, because you know how many times I've put your magazine up and forget about it, it's not important, but I, I just want to give you some background on some of your guests here. This is Thermopolis, he's into guns and drugs, Hugh Hefner, and this is Max, and Max kills cops for a living! Given what they shot, I sure would have liked to have seen that scene go on. I wish the whole movie had been set in the mansion compared to what they actually did shoot here. It could have been very funny with Murphy mixing it up with a whole bunch of Hollywood types. But Beverly Hills Cop 2 was directed by Tony Scott, who just directed the best-selling film Top Gun. And I think what Scott has done, I think what this movie has done, is basically turn Eddie Murphy into a walking, talking airplane, surrounded by <laughs> noise, car crashes, and aggravating wall-to-wall -wall music. It actually hurt my eyes and ears to watch this film. Filmmakers, please, leave Eddie Murphy alone. Let him just talk to us, please. The original idea for Beverly Hills Cop was a good one. A tough street cop from Detroit goes to Los Angeles where he's a fish out of water. He doesn't know how to act with all of these chic people, but he manages to do his own he's thing. He's outsmarts them They all. got about half of that in the first movie. They don't have anything in this movie. It's the people in Beverly Hills who are out of water because what Eddie Murphy does in this film is just scream at them all the time, and it's not funny. The very first clip we showed on this show, where he has that gun against the guy's mm. head. I don't know how you felt. Did that make you feel, make you laugh because Eddie Murphy is such a funny guy? No, it made me feel sorry for the poor guy that has this gun pointed at him while this guy is screaming and wisecracking at him. He turns into a loudmouth, obnoxious bore in this movie, yeah. and that's not funny. Well, the, when you say loud, I mean, I, I can't stand pictures that don't have the confidence to be quiet. Yes. This picture is just strung with rock mm -hmm. music all the way along. If you can't be confident when you've got Eddie Murphy who can sit here on this set and be funny for two hours just looking at the camera, this, why, won't they, why won't they just let the guy talk? This movie is high-tech assembly line movie making by the numbers. It has no creativity, it has no acting, it has no humor. If they hire him, why don't they let him? That's right. Hire that's right. him, this use him. Could have, you could have plugged anybody into this movie and it would have been just as bad. Next movie. 
Our next movie is an idealistic fantasy named Amazing Grace and Chuck. Maybe I'll calm down a little bit now. This is a more of a calmer well, movie. But than you the get last ticked one. off because the guy is a star yes, and they right. missed You're trashing completely. him. <laughs> Another four movies like this, and Eddie Murphy is going to be in the same bag that Stallone is uh, with movies like Over the Top and uh, Cobra. They're yeah. just going to. They're gonna they're gonna compartmentalize him. They're gonna take what's special about him and throw it out and turn him into just another ordinary assembly yeah. line action star. We're still Ed angry. Murphy is a comedian. He's not a violent action star. Don't trash him that way. Now the next movie. What did I say it was? Amazing Grace and Chuck. Still upset. A little bit of a change of pace here. The story of a little league pitcher <laughs> who goes on a tour of a nuclear missile base and he's so disturbed by what he sees that he refuses to pitch anymore. He's just a kid. He's about 12 years old. He doesn't have any big master plan. He simply says, until the bombs go away, he says, it's my duty to refuse to do the thing that I do the best, which is pitch Little League Baseball. The kid's decision makes the national news, and in this scene, his father is angry over how the publicity has upset their family life. Your mother has to use the back door to her own home now. Would you like to hear some of the calls I'm getting down at the lumberyard? That's Joshua Zolke as the idealistic young pitcher, and William L. Peterson as his father. Meanwhile, in Boston, amazing Grace Smith, a star basketball player for the Celtics, played by Alex English, hears about what Chuck has done, and he decides to do the same thing. Stop playing basketball until the bombs go away. He comes out west to visit the kid, and in this scene, the father and the basketball player trade angry words. I'd kind of like to take my son fishing Sunday, if that's okay with you. Sure. You can even take him out to supper as long as you have him home early. Jamie Lee Curtis plays the player's business manager, and like a lot of people, she's upset by his decision. But what do you want me to do? I just want you to come back. Just come back to Boston. Come back to the team. The protest grows into a worldwide movement on both sides of the Iron Curtain, and Gregory Peck plays the U.S. president who tries to talk Chuck out of his protest. This movie ends with the words, wouldn't it be nice? And I guess that's the bottom line for the whole picture. Wouldn't it be nice if one little leaguer's concern about nuclear weapons did grow or could grow into a worldwide peace movement? Amazing Grace and Chuck did not convince me that such a movement would be possible, but I don't think that was the purpose of the movie, to be realistic. I think this movie is more of a fantasy, more of a parable that asks the question, could any of us really go on with our daily lives if we really stopped to think about the massive overkill of the world's nuclear arsenal? This movie makes the whole issue very personal, very simple. This kid just doesn't see the point of pitching one more inning if we're all going to go on making bombs to kill everybody a thousand, thousand times over. I started out in a mood to be sort of condescending toward this movie in the first half hour or so, but in the end, with its innocence and its simplicity, it sort of won me over. It did win me over, too, and I'll tell you, I originally I thought it was just an expanded made-for-TV movie. Yeah. It starts out and it looks that way, and you mm -hmm. think it'll be promoted as you know an anti-war film and mm -hmm. cute and all that kind of a thing. I think what makes the movie work as a movie, like worth playing in a big theater, frankly, is the script. Mm -hmm. Because the script is very minimal. The kid is very quiet. Yeah. He just simply says, I won't play. Mm -hmm. He doesn't answer a lot of questions. He does it almost, I, I don't want to compare him to Gandhi, but the, the essence is, in being quiet, mm -hmm. you gain power. And then another person joins him. Yeah. And they're quiet. And the dialogue with the president, which can be obviously very cornball, little boy and president, if there's a lot of talking back and forth, the kid is still quiet. I was so yeah. impressed yeah. that somebody was on the set, Mike Newell, the director, and then David Field, who wrote the script, yeah. mm -hmm. kept things down and quiet. They don't make the mistake of trying to explain too much yes. and turn into a lot of political speeches. Now, the scene where Gregory Peck comes in, this is an old Hollywood tradition. Right. You get a legendary actor, yeah. somebody like Gregory Peck, and you have him play the president of the right. United States, and then he comes over ordinarily as wooden and phony. Yes. Not this time. Yes. Gregory Peck convinced me yes. that he was listening to this kid. Yes. He had a lot of things on his mind, yes. but he also was open enough to, to understand what the kid was trying to do. That was a very hard act to pull All right. And the reason I think it works is when they give us a little bit of dialogue, not too much, mm -hmm. we have time to think, what would we do in that situation? Yeah. And you sit there thinking, maybe I should give up kind my job. Kind of a surprisingly nice picture. Yeah. Coming up next, two of our very biggest stars, Warren Beatty and Dustin Hoffman, play would-be singer-songwriters in Ishtar. She said, come look, there's a wardrobe of love in my eyes. One of the great disappointments of the year, I'm sad to say. Warren Beatty and Dustin Hoffman, two of our finest movie talents coming off of big films from about four and a half years ago, Reds and Tootsie, now directed by Elaine May, who has made some very good pictures. A New Leaf, for example. 
Now, how can people as bright as these three come up with this mess called Ishtar? For one thing, not for a second did I believe Hoffman and Beatty as would-be Simon and Garfunkel singing so badly that they leave the audience aghast as they try to make it in show business. men refuse to believe they have no musical talent, or we believe it, as they compose ridiculous song after song. I got it. I got it. If you admit that you can play the accordion, no one will hire you in a rock and roll band. Man, oh man, when you're on, you're on. Hello, hello, baby. Baby. That's not funny. It's just dull. Desperate for a job? Anywhere. They take a gig in Morocco. They become involved in Middle East politics and wind up wandering the desert still singing their song badly. My lips are on fire with my desire for you. Good song. So let me drink some water. Uh -huh. Let me drink the wine. If you're not my daughter, will you still be mine? <laughs> they're laughing and we're not and that's late in the film and we haven't been laughing and when we see them laughing it's offensive a little of their singing goes a long way now what i haven't shown you and it really doesn't work at all is the film's action-filled story of political intrigue as Beatty and hoffman become pawns in a confrontation between libya and the united states over this mythical nation called ishtar now, obviously, some kind of political commentary is intended. Politicians are corrupt. At least these guys are trying to sing, so hooray for the artists, down with the politicians. But that message is strange. There's so many blind camel jokes and so many stupid hijinks with Arab characters that the only satisfying moments in this elaborate film are provided by Charles Grodin as a CIA agent trying to stop Beatty and Hoffman from upsetting the balance of power in the Middle East. Well, I wish he had stopped them from singing and from wandering the desert because Ishtar is a crushing bore. It sure is. I think we have a real good candidate for our worst 10 movies of the year right here. And the sad thing about this film is a comedy should have a lightness of touch. It should have a lightness of being. It should seem like the people in the movie are having fun, as if they want the audience to have fun. And this movie seems regimented right down into the ground. The characters are not funny. Their songs are pathetic. I mean, uh, I know that they were trying to make them sound bad, but they succeeded all too well in making them sound so bad that they aren't even funny whether they're bad or not. And then they get to, to, to the Middle East, the camels and the sand and the, and the, the, the subplot. Uh, this movie, at that point, it just seems to just totally evaporate into terminal desperation. There is just nothing here to grab onto. I sat in the theater, and with all the best will in the world, I was, I was trying to smile, and I was just looking at this disaster on the screen and saying, how in the world was this movie, why did anybody think that this was funny? Again, it has to be laid at the script. I mean, yeah. you don't, you have two of the most charismatic actors we have mm -hmm. around. Playing against charisma, by the way. Yes, playing yes. dullards. Yes. And you know, Warren Beatty had trouble playing a dullard in another film. The directed, Fortune. The Fortune, directed, yes. oddly enough, uh -huh. by Elaine May's old partner, Mike Nichols, and right. it didn't work there, so maybe there's a lesson to be learned there. Dustin Hoffman seems in change, mm -hmm. like he wants to break through and yeah. just take over the movie, mm -hmm. isn't given a chance. Instead, he does have to wander the desert. I don't want to see those guys crawling around in the sand. Mm. That isn't funny. Hope and Crosby can do it funnier and did it funnier. It's a big shootout when they're shooting at the helicopter. Oh, who cares about gun. that? Come on, you know. You don't on. even want to yeah, see Stallone right. do that, let uh -huh. alone two great actors. You know what I would have liked? would have been probably hilarious documentary on the making of this movie. Or either that or just Charles Grodin alone. Well, then we would have had another movie, which would have been would have shorter. Been, would have been shorter and better. When we come back, the latest adventures of the chipmunks. Name the chipmunk adventure, and yes, it stars Alvin and Theodore and Simon from the 1960s hit record, along with three new female stars named the Chipettes. Now, I got a little confused, though, because the chipmunks are actually chipmunks, and the chipettes are little girls. Apparently, the chipmunks live in a universe, though, anyway, where extensive 
gene splicing has taken place since their father in the movie is a human being right. who leaves on a trip after which some evil villains trick the chipmunks and the chipettes into making an around-the-world balloon trip to deliver some stolen diamonds. The chipmunks have adventures in Mexico and get to sing one of their cute little songs. The fun has just begun. It is our annual fiesta. <laughs> A little later, the chipettes go scuba diving underwater in the Bahamas. Just remember, the team that wins gets the hundred thousand dollars. The movie finds time for several chipmunk musical numbers in which the little beasts sing in their irritating little squeaky high-pitched chipmunk voices until you're just about ready to go crazy. <laughs> the animation in this movie is better than the Saturday morning TV assembly line cartoons, but not by much, oh. and the story is dumb and predictable from beginning to end. Why couldn't the chipmunks have had a real fantastical adventure, a magical world maybe, instead of getting involved in a stolen jewelry caver that seems recycled out of TV crime shows? That's a problem. And so are those chirping, chirpy little voices. I couldn't stand them the first time I heard them 20 years ago. I still can't stand them. They haven't gotten any better. And in this movie, they really got, you know, it's, it's kind of fingernails on the blackboard time yeah. every time they sing. You, in other words, you want surgery on the script and on their vocal cords. Yes, both, yes. Uh, I think that, uh, yeah, they're aggravating. I mean, who <laughs> wants to be in their presence? I mean, they're in, they are absolutely <laughs> aggravating. I don't know that kids will think it's cute. Um, the whole thing of the girls suddenly launching into becoming a rock and roll band yeah. is right out of Saturday morning yes, TV. Yes. And so I think that even your gratuitous little uh, remark, a gratuitous compliment, tiny compliment, that is better than <laughs> Saturday morning TV, be very careful about that because some studio might want to use it in the ads. This is just as bad as Saturday morning TV. Okay, coming up next, our home video recommendations, including a wicked comedy about a marriage and Michael Caine in his second starring role. Do you know how to use this? Coke 32, yeah. I'd sooner have my automatic. You'll use the coat. I'll use the coat. Yo, segment. I'm picking a film that's new in video stores and was written and directed in 1942 by Preston Sturges, one of the most clever of Hollywood's writer-directors. The film is a Palm Beach story, and it's a sharp little comedy about marriage and money as Claudette Colbert tires of her marriage to Joe McRae and tries to scare up some money, first to pay the rent and then to get out of town. A wickedly funny, rich old man tours her apartment, which is for rent, and he surprises her with some cash. How much rent do you owe? That isn't really your business. I can't hear you. You're mumbling. I said it isn't really your business. I'm in the sausage business. Don't worry about me. This will be a hot one on the wife who's down there poking a snoot in everybody's business. They ain't gone by that varmint. How much do you need? Later, Colbert worms her way onto a train full of wealthy men depicted here as boors in a famous scene of them skeet shooting in a train's club car. Gentlemen, if I were you, why don't you wait for the... That's really outlandish humor, but the best part of the film is the wicked way and the offhanded way that writer-director Preston Sturgis treats marriage as a business proposition. If you can get a better deal, he says, take it. it Sounds like of, youth cars. It is kind of shocking the way Claudette Colbert uh, explains to Joel McRae exactly what all the math of the situation right. is. <laughs> Romance has nothing to do exactly. with it. Next video. My choice this week is The Ip Chris File, a 1965 British thriller that was the movie that made Michael Caine a movie star. In the film, Caine is a British intelligence agent named Harry Palmer, who has a quiet, ironic sense of humor. Bobby likes to know about his new boys. Have you seen everything? Yes, thank you. Then you know where the whiskey is? Yes. Fix us both one, will you? The Ip Chris file came out at the height of James Bond's popularity, but it wasn't a ripoff of Bond because even then, Michael Caine was too particular an actor 
to ever seem like anybody else. This yeah. was only his second film. Yeah, three uh, films had come out uh, from the Bond series, Goldfinger, Dr. No, yeah. From Russia With Love, and here was an average guy. Yeah. And I remember yeah. people were shocked. You know, it also happened with the spy who came in from the cult. It was exciting to see yeah, an average guy. An ordinary guy, guy, not a super agent. And Kane makes that exciting. He makes ordinary exciting. That's a star. Now let's recap our reaction to the movies on this show. Neither one of us liked the Eddie Murphy sequel, Beverly Hills Cop 2. Too much action, not enough Murphy, two thumbs down. We were both surprised by the quietly effective anti-nuclear film, Amazing Grace and Chuck, two thumbs up. And we agreed again on Ishtar, a candidate for one of the worst movies of the year, wasting Dustin Hoffman and Warren Beatty, two thumbs down. And as for the chipmunk adventure, they're whiny, we hated them, the brainless story, and the cheap animation. Two thumbs down. <laughs> I can't believe it. With all the star power, Amazing Grace and Chuck is the one film we like. Real disappointments from the big mm -hmm. stars. That's it for this week. And until then, the balcony is closed. Mm -hmm.